on the one hand, the Qur'an demands that we understand it. And it demands that we understand it very, very well. Um, and so these durus and these hadaqat of tafsir... Liyah, Bida? Liyah? It's recording. Sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry. I had to stop my daughter from playing in the masjid. Hold on. <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, so on the one hand, you know, these, these hadaqat are very important and they're good, but at the same time, I feel like sometimes it turns us into couch potatoes. So we just listen to a lecture about the Qur'an and that is our getting closer to the Qur'an. Well, that's only one part of it. And the other parts of it that are equally, I would argue, even if not more important, are uh, you know, memorizing the Qur'an, uh, reciting the Qur'an every day, trying to make sure that you're reciting it in a way that's better and better. These are the pra this is the practical dimension of our relationship with the Qur'an. And so when somebody really wants to prepare for Ramadan very, very well, I mean, the, the first basic piece of advice I would give you, I mean, I'm talking to so many different kinds of people, excuse me, I'm talking to so many different kinds of people right now. Some of you are mothers, some of you are students, some of you are employees. You have different kinds of schedules and different kinds of obligations. So you have to figure this out, this piece of advice out for yourself, how it's going to work specifically. But making time to recite the Qur'an every day, like pick, put everything else down. And I'm not just talking about the Qur'an you've already memorized. I'm talking about picking a time in the day, preferably after one of the prayers, like after Fajr, after Aisha, or good, good nice times, or after Maghrib even. And this is not after Ramadan starts, but this is from now. And just sitting with the Book of Allah and reciting. If you can't handle a lot, then at least a couple of pages. And you'll notice that you get lazy very quickly. Like you recite a little bit and you start yawning or you start feeling like I gotta do something else. It's not the couch potato because you're actively doing it yourself. You're not just sitting back and listening and you can tune out or tune in. You actually actively have to put an effort into reciting the Quran. And this is really where your personal uh, litmus test is going to come to play. How much time really do I enjoy spending with this book? And if you don't get in the habit of reciting it regularly, the next step that I'm trying to advise you of, which is going to be to try and memorize it, that's never even going to start. That's, forget that road, you know. So the, the first thing is get into the habit of reciting the Qur'an every day. This is, I'm not saying this as a replacement of the lectures and the talks and this other stuff. I'm saying that, you know, uh, saying this as a basic practical starting point in your own personal journey with the Qur'an. And it's something that, um, the scholars among us, the speakers among us, those who don't know much at all about Arabic or Qur'an or Tafsir, all of them are in the same boat when it comes to this. This is something we equally have to give importance to. So just because I've been stu or trying to study at least the Qur'an for the last decade, doesn't mean that I'm exempt for having to recite the Qur'an, of, you know, a, a decent amount of, it, amount of it every single day. It doesn't make me exempt. It's something I need as much as you need and even my teachers need. It's not something that anybody will graduate beyond. That's the beauty of this book, that we're never past it. We can't just say, oh, I already recited that page. Oh, I already recited this surah. It doesn't work like that. And Ramadan is a great opportunity for instilling and reinforcing those good habits, inshallah ta'ala. So my first two bits of advice, get in the habit of reciting Quran regularly from now until the beginning of Ramadan, manageable amounts. You know, that's the other thing that I was mentioning in this khutbah of mine last week, is Ramadan comes and we go overboard, right? So there's a person who doesn't even pray. If they pray, maybe they pray uh, uh, at home. And then in Ramadan, for 30 straight days, they come to the masjid and they're there for 8 or 20 taraweeh, exhausting themselves. Halfway into it, they can't even wait for Ramadan to be over. Like they can go back to normal again. This is unhealthy actually. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't make 20 taraweeh or 8 taraweeh. Please go ahead. But get into good habits that you can keep alive or bring to life before Ramadan starts and you can keep them alive after Ramadan is over. So yes, when Ramadan starts, recite a whole juz every day, two juz a day if you can. Go ahead. But if you can't handle that after Ramadan is done, then start with something far more manageable. What's, what's, what's manageable and sustainable is far better for you. You know, ma qalla wa kafa. What's little and is enough. What's little and is, is enough. You know, khayrul umuri adwa muha. Khayrul a'mal adwa muha. The best of the deeds are the ones that are the most constant. And the most constant deeds are the ones that are the most manageable. They're, not, they're the ones that you can, you wouldn't have to go out of your way to maintain. 
So first bit of advice, recite Qur'an regularly from now on every single day. My personal recommended time is after Fajr. It's a particularly peaceful time and an easy, it's, it's, uh, there's an enjoyment in the Qur'an and the barakah of it, you'll enjoy the rest of your day. The blessings of that, you'll feel the effects of it in, at your work, in school, in whatever you, you carry yourself doing, you're going to see the benefits of it. And that's one more point on the side that I wanted to make before I share with you the next bit of advice. And that is that we often don't realize the spiritual benefits of praying in the masjid, of reciting the Qur'an, of ibadah itself, active acts of worship, extra prayers, nawafil, Actually, you know, you guys will know the difference between a prayer that's just a hit and run, literally like you bang your head on the floor a couple of times and made sajda and got the salat out of the way, or you took your time and prayed peacefully. You will notice the difference not only in the prayer, but how you feel that day after the prayer. The day you make it to the masjid to pray fajr, the day you make it to the masjid to pray isha, you're going to feel different. It's gonna, you're going to be at a peace that you haven't enjoyed before. And you, you can, from your past experience, already testify to those differences. It does make, in fact, a difference. And those are the, the, these are some of the joys of Islam. One of the joys of our Iman is that we get to taste its fruits even in this life. You don't have to be an advanced scholar or a zahid of you know, some really high spiritual status to enjoy these things. Even if you have, you're not in the habit of regularly praying in the masjid or reciting a lot of Qur'an, you get started now, you'll start tasting the sweetness of it right away. It's not something you're going to have to wait for. So I pray that all of you get to enjoy that sweetness and get in that beautiful habit, inshaAllah ta'ala. That's my first bit of advice. The second bit of advice that I want to share with you about the month of Ramadan, Again, because keeping in mind that you know, there are all kinds of audiences that are listening to this talk. And I, you have different family situations, social situations that I can't even imagine. But I, I do want to make an educated guess that a lot of you belong to families where there are significant family members that aren't interested in religion. They're not very quote-unquote religious. And they don't necessarily care for learning the religion more, learning Islam more, or worshipping more. But even those kinds of members of the family, when it comes to Ramadan, they kind of turn towards the deen a little more than usual. I mean, the most they'll become religious will be in this month. And I, I see that as a golden opportunity, not to complain about those people. Usually what happens in the khutbah is in the Eid khutbah or in the last khutbah of Ramadan, the khatib is angry at the crowd and says, don't just come here every Ramadan and then disappear. Come here every single, you know, every single night of the prayer or whatever. I only see you at the Eid prayer, etc., etc. Instead of using that as an opportunity to vent your frustrations, in fact, that's an opportunity to invite people as guests. These people have come. They're, they don't normally come. So the fact that they even show up is a favor. It's not something we should complain about. We should look at it the other way. These are people that otherwise have little or nothing to do with the faith now. You know, they're barely, barely holding on to the faith. So take it as an opportunity to invite them. I know they're going to set up. That's okay. Don't worry about it. I don't think. Sorry, guys. Interruption in the middle. Sorry. And I was said, Jill, Asif. Okay. So uh, uh, what I wanted to tell you then is. In your family, if you have a hard time bringing up deen, bringing up a religious conversation, maybe the value, the beauty of prayer, uh, maybe something you recited from the Qur'an or you heard something being explained about the Qur'an that you found particularly beautiful. Ramadan is a really nice opportunity when you go over to iftar at your cousin's house and you go get invited to that, that friend's house or that you invite them over to your house when you never actually get a healthy opportunity to talk about the religion, now you get an opportunity. Now you've got a, like a, a disarmed, you know, a, a non-confrontational opportunity to speak to, to your friends and family in a way that's not going to create an argument. You don't want to have arguments and debates in Ramadan. Don't fall into those debates. And don't allow those debates to become dominant in, in, in your conversation with others. Ramadan is about getting closer to Allah and maybe doing your part in helping somebody else get closer to Allah. What you've come to appreciate, you help somebody else appreciate alongside you, right? That's what you want to be able to do. So on that note, I want to take you to my third and my final bit of advice that again, I think applies to myself. And I'd like to share that with you also, inshallah. And that is that, you know, when you talk to folks, uh, you're going to get an opportunity to interact with folks in Ramadan that you don't normally see the rest of the year. Or you don't, like I said, you don't normally get to talk to them about their religion the rest of the year. 
But you know what those kinds of people, they have all kinds of interesting and weird opinions about Islam. And they're members of your family, it could be your uncle, it could be your cousin, it could be your you know, grandfather or whatever. So when you do talk about the deen, they'll bring up these tangent, weird ideas of theirs, and then they'll ask you your opinion about them. You know, they'll start, maybe some, one of your relatives will start criticizing, ah, oh, hadith is all made up, what does that mean anyway? We should just follow the Qur'an. Or some other will say, you know, well, the Qur'an talks about alcohol, but, you know, it's not the same as beer, so it's okay. And you'll be sitting there going, what are you talking about? Why are you talking like this? And it'll make you upset, because obviously these are some very basic things in, in the religion, and these people are bringing them up almost as a joke. Or they're bringing up really absurd, ridiculous understandings of the religion that can boil your blood. Here I'm particularly talking to the young in the audience that feel like they have to defend the faith at any cost, even if it means severing family ties. That's the point where you have to take a, put, put the brakes on your tongue, hold yourself back, and allow the conversation to be steered back in a good direction. I just wanted to talk about getting closer to Allah. I just wanted to talk about the, you know, how great I felt, how great the recitation of Qur'an was the other night. Change the subject. Don't go into debates. Don't go into religious arguments. This is not the month to do it. That's not the time to do it. Everybody should walk away with a good taste in their mouth after a conversation about deen in this month. Yes, those issues should be hashed out and they should be discussed, but you find another time to do them. This shaitan is out of the picture right now. These people are ripe for da'wah and that will entirely depend on your mannerism and your patience and your courtesy with them in trying to deliver that message. And some of you, some of your, the, the sisters that are listening right now will have to do that with their husbands who are averse to the religion. There are some husbands whose wives don't really like anything to do with Islam. You know, they, 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 feel, they think that, like you've become too religious. This will be the opportunity to soften those hearts. There may be your parents. Your parents think you've become too religious. You're fanatic, you know, and they're upset with you. They, they criticize you all the time. And th this will be a chance for you to not respond to those things like, you know, impulsively and become reactionary, but rather to be very, very patient, very calm in your, in your uh, uh, reaction to them and keep the atmosphere positive uh, and good. Another bit of advice that's tied to this, this was with family, another bit of advice is with friends. All of us have friends that aren't very religious. Or maybe they're, you know, old friends from college or even high school or, you know, they're friends now and you keep in touch but you don't really, you're, if you do talk about things that maybe you talk about sports, you talk about a movie that just came out, you talk about video games, whatever you talk about, you don't talk about deen. This is the month to try to invite one of your friends, hey, come over for a thought, let's go to the masjid and pray. And just, you know, hang out with them. And just pray even, you don't last the entire 20, just go for Aisha and bring them back or something. And you don't even have to preach a word. Just try to bring them into that environment. Just that environment. And then let Allah do the rest. Maybe they'll just, just being in a masjid after so long will do something to their heart. It happens. It, it really does. So you, you, you and I are not in charge of changing people's hearts. But we can certainly try to bring them to a good, positive environment. And then if there's goodness in them, and I'm sure there is, it's going to flourish. Allah will allow it to flourish subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the month to try and do that. To mend family ties, to, to, being, to, to help friends come to closer or better company, inshallah ta'ala. And for you personally, as I started my talk with, for you and me, it's just we, should, we should have memorized more Qur'an at the end of this Ramadan than we knew when going in. We should have recited more Qur'an than we had come in with. Some of, you know, we, we have these perfectionist ideas, I'm going to finish the entire Qur'an three times in Ramadan. That intention lasts about, what, a week? And then you run out of gas. Then you say, okay, at least I'll recite it, the whole Qur'an once in the month of Ramadan. And you start out like that, but then again you run out of steam. Why? Because you're not in that habit, which means you have to get started from now. You have to get yourself in that habit from now, inshallah ta'ala. And I, and I really hope that you do that, that I do that, and you do that, and we don't get lazy this Ramadan. The worst thing you can do is Ramadan came to an end, and you look back and you say, man, another Ramadan went and I didn't really fully take advantage of it. I ran out of steam too early. You don't want that to happen to you this Ramadan. This is, this is not the Ramadan that you, you and I are going to allow that to happen. Inshallah, we're going to get ourselves in here ahead of time. Uh, I know my, my time is pretty much up because I have to go and prepare for another class. But what I, as parting advice, what I wanted to share with you, especially for the young in the audience, inshallah, 
is take care of your sunnah prayers. Like pray the sunnah before the, before the fard prayers, pray the sunnah after the fard prayers, pray them in the masjid or come home and pray them, but take care of them. That is a huge part of reaping the spiritual benefits of ibadah. And it will get rid of laziness from you. You know, you'll become active in doing worship. Because Ramadan is a time of extra worship. So, and if you're, if you're even barely making the energy to do the fard, the obligatory prayers, then in Ramadan you're going to really, honestly, you're just going to run out of steam very, very quickly. You're not going to have the energy to do much. And it's going to be an opportunity wasted. So you want to take advantage of, you know, adding a little bit more ibadah than usual from now on. Make sure you make those two rakahs after Maghrib. Make sure you pray your sunnahs after Dhuhr. Make sure that you, you, know, you complete all the sunnah and even the nawafil after Asha and things like that. Just make sure you, you, you take care of those extra acts of worship. And you sit and you make dua by yourself. You put yourself in that situation so you're trained to really, really take advantage of this Ramadan. I pray that you and I are able to learn a lot about the Qur'an and memorize and recite. I pray that all of us are able to, to worship Allah in a way that we haven't done before or we've gotten too lazy to do. That you know, you don't, we don't compare ourselves to the person praying next to us, but we should at least compare ourselves to our own selves from before Ramadan started or from yesterday to today. At least we should have that comparison. I should be a better Muslim today than I was yesterday. I'm just going to wrap up inshallah ta'ala. I'm, I'm very optimistic about this Ramadan. Um, I think it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful month for all Muslims, especially us here in the U.S. Inshallah Taala. I wanted to uh, extend my salams to all of you and your families and make du'a that their fasting and their, you know, their their uh, worship is all uh, accepted by Allah Azza wa Jalla and they, that they make most of it. You know, Ramadan is going to be late nights all across the country. Isha is going to be really late, which means Taraweeh is going to be extra late after that. Which means guys, I'm specifically talking to the guys now, don't hang out after prayer. Go to sleep. Go to sleep because it's going to ruin your Fajr. What's the point of praying 20 Taraweeh and you can't even wake up for Fajr? That's, it's, it's an exercise in futility. So make your, make your worship, but make sure you have a healthy sleep schedule. Make sure you don't overdo it so you can stay on course and make, you know, uh, be productive inshallah ta'ala throughout the entire month. So these are a few bits of advice that I wanted to remind myself of and remind all of you of in getting ready for the beautiful month of Ramadan. May Allah Azza wa Jal make this a month where we are closer to the Qur'an than we've ever been. And may Allah Azza wa Jal help you and I understand this book, enjoy this book, love this book, memorize this book, and act on this book as it deserves to be acted on. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات وذكر الحكيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته